Hello everyone and welcome to this rather special video. So first of all, I want to acknowledge this channel has been quiet for a couple of weeks. The first reason for that is that I am now in a new house, Pixel Girl and I moved, um, and that obviously sort of was quite stressful. But secondly, I have been traveling a lot this past month, getting footage for future science videos, some of which are quite close to completion and others are going to be released much further down the line. But there's some really exciting stuff coming Thank you for your patience. This video, however, is something completely different. This video is going to be about the theoretical side of YouTube. And what I mean by that is how the platform has evolved over time, how the meta has shifted, how YouTube and society interact with each other. And this is a topic that I've alluded to in previous videos and on my podcast, but I wanted to do this video because I had access to a really interesting guy. This is Chris Stokel Walker, who's a journalist who's just published a book last week called YouTubers, which is about the multifaceted nature of this website and its interactions with society. If you're interested, by the way, there'll be a link to the book in the doobly-doo. Now, this isn't a sponsored video at all. In fact, this is actually the opposite. I came to him and asked if we could do a video talking about the subject because he more than probably anyone else on the planet, really understands the multifaceted nature of YouTube and where it's going. So this is going to be totally different to one of my normal videos. This is basically an extended discussion between me and Chris on the subject of YouTube. If you find that interesting, then please do stick around. Let me know what you think in the comments, because I'd, I'd love this to spark a discussion between me and the audience, because that's, well, that's partly what makes this website so special. If you are here expecting a science video, then that's not going to be this. I will be back very soon with another one of those. So thank you for watching up to this far, but um, yeah, bye. That said, if you're still watching the video, then I hope you enjoyed this discussion. And if you find this interesting, then do consider checking Chris's book out. Enjoy. For people who um, have stumbled across this video and want to know more about the book specifically, what's it about? What's the kind of premise? It is a vain attempt to summarise 14 years of YouTube in 352 pages, I think, is probably the best way to describe it. No, it's, it's about... Um... It's about the platform, the creators on it, the different uh, associated industries that have come out as a result of it, uh, its impact on society, its impact on the media, which is changing an awful lot, mm -hmm. and where we might go in the future with this weird thing. So who, who is it aimed at? Who's, who's... So in, this is the interesting thing, and I think we probably we talked about this before in terms of the differing audiences. So it was initially aimed purely at hardcore YouTube fans and creators and things like that. Um, my publisher quite rightly said that's really interesting, but there's a large audience that maybe want to know more about this. Uh, and so it's kind of zoomed out a little bit more. So um, while it's useful for people's parents and grandparents to know about this thing, uh, there's still plenty of stuff in there that will let even the most hardcore YouTube aficionados hopefully mm. learn something. Yeah, because I mean, I've, I've read it. Uh, I actually devoured it. I, I don't think I've ever read a book as quickly as this, apart from maybe The Great Gatsby. It was super interesting as a creator to have somebody come at it from an analytical perspective. And we've talked about this before, yeah. um, that there is a certain lack of, not necessarily self-awareness, but on YouTube and off YouTube, people don't really seem to take the format seriously. You know, it is a frivolity, seemingly in the minds of people. But that, I think, as we talked about before, is the age difference, right? Yeah, exactly. It is. It, and, and this is part of the issue that I have as a working journalist who has been trying to cover this stuff for five, six, seven years, is that I will suggest an idea. Something massive is happening on YouTube or YouTube is having a massive cultural impact. And I will email my editor and say, we really need to be covering this. And then they will come back and say, well, I'm a 50-year-old man. I don't care about this. I watch the news at six o'clock at night every day on TV, and that's it. I maybe watch Netflix, but I have no real interest in mm. new media, as it's meant to be and called. And yet, the, the reach of the six o'clock news at night is probably comparable to the very top tier of YouTube channels. There's, there's a perfect example in the book um, where after the KSI Logan Paul fight, I went on BBC Breakfast TV the mm. day after, and that's seen by an average of like 1.5 million people every morning. Now. The KSI Logan Paul fight was seen by like more than that. Yeah, I mean, the number of pirate streams was like at least one and a half million. So yeah. the, the disparate sort of scale of this is ridiculous. And I don't understand 
how you get that across. I think you know, we, we've talked about this before that we do need to have a generational change on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, it's when the people who grew up on YouTube become the people who make the decisions in traditional media. Yeah. That's it's going to change. So, it, it, so you know, you mentioned that um, you're a journalist who covers this as part of your day job. Um, who have you? Who did you interview as part of this book? So it's basically the culmination of sort of years of reporting. So um, you know, there's, there's things in there from big names like KSI, uh, Emma Blackery, people like that. Uh, the the Green Brothers are in there because I've spoken to them for Wire before, um, and it's kind of built around several scenes as well. So mm. um, loads of people I've interacted with. There's probably more than a hundred interviewees in there, both people in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, mm. A lot of agents, uh, Sarah Weichel, um, who is a uh, massive sort of Hannah Hart's agent, uh, Lily Singh's agent, and, and people who are kind of you know, creating MCNs or new talent agencies as well, because I, I kind of wanted, it's an impossible task, and uh, you know I'm fully aware that there are gaps in this, but it's an attempt to try and get across as best as possible the, the scale and the scope of this thing. Well, it's like I said in, in my written review for this, that it's like a blind man touching an elephant. Yeah. You know, it, 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 nobody, no single description, no single perspective can do justice to YouTube because what, what the website is is totally different to parents, to young people, to broadcasters, to Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. <laughs> But the, but the interesting thing is that um, while you can't get the elephant in the totality, what we've had up till now, particularly in terms of mainstream press coverage, is very reductive. It is what has Logan Paul done? Yeah. What has Jake Paul done? What is the latest scandal? Whereas this is an attempt to try and round out that view a little bit more because there are only a handful of journalists who are actually covering this stuff with the respect that it deserves and you, know, you have Amelia Tate in the UK, you have Taylor Lorenz and Julia Alexander in the US and so this is just an attempt really to, to try and give a more accurate view of what this thing is. This is in a way then almost like a field diary of, of you know you going out into the field and talking to YouTubers yeah. to report back to all the other people in the sector. Yeah and also you know people who kind of are on the periphery of YouTube. So there's an example there, the day after the Brexit vote in 2016, I went down to Brighton and watched a bunch of old people talk about what they thought YouTube was as a way of marketing their business. And it was awful, like it was, it was ridiculous. But that's in there as like a comic relief thing to show this generational gap that we talk about, mm. basically. So I, yeah, it's, um, it is a real challenge to, to get across all of this site, but, I think that it's important that someone starts that conversation. This almost. is the first yeah. that's, that's ever done this, really. And, it, and 14 years in, because something that you do talk about in the book is the, the, the fact that YouTubers have very real life consequences. So there was the murder of um, Christina Grimming. Christina Grimming, yeah. Um, and the, the terrorist, uh, I guess you could, yeah, you would call them terrorist attacks on the YouTube HQ, people rocking up yeah. and trying to change policy. You know, it, it, the YouTube has a really dark side that even that seems to be poorly represented in mainstream media. Yeah, well, because they they basically don't understand it, and I find it alarming given the power that this site has. I mean, I I go through these numbers all the time, and you know them, and, and everybody else knows them. But 1.9 billion monthly users. Yeah. Think about the world's population. Think about the fact that half of them don't have internet access. Think about the fact that China isn't really a market. Yeah. And so suddenly you're looking at basically the entire internet connected world is on YouTube. And it does have real life experiences. It bleeds over. There's this idea, I suppose, that everything that happens on YouTube is online only and we still want to like partition it in its own little weird box um, and it does a disservice to what this platform is I think. So that, that does bring something up that I wanted to talk about, uh, Girl Online. Um, you, did you uh, try and approach Zoella to, to talk about the book? I did not because um, there's no real reason to, I don't think. But I think... She's, she's seen uh, certainly in the UK community as like almost the figurehead of the YouTube UK community. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't want to start beef. That's <laughs> okay, anything like okay. that. I don't, I don't want to get any drama. I don't want to be on drama alert. But I do think that she represents a different type of YouTube, and I think particularly in the mainstream press, 
she is massively successful and so is Alfie and, and it's great that they're doing that mm. and A to Z Creatives is a really interesting development in terms of how you build out a staff mm. um, but I also think that she almost represents like a, a previous generation of YouTube and I think that she's grasped that a bit too readily by the mainstream media to try and represent what YouTube is. I mean you look at you know her subscription numbers and things like that and and her views and they are going down more I think than the average persons are so yeah and, and that's the thing so it's from the perspective of an active youtuber it, the number of subscribers doesn't mean anything yeah dead as, metric as far as that well I think some advertisers don't know this but, yeah. you know advertisers who know what they're talking about know that it's views yeah. on a, a typical upload that counts so you know she that was I did wonder if that was why because she is in, in many ways part of the old guard um, there are plenty of people like what the what the buck show yeah. another example um, who had massive popularity early on the website but then because subscriptions don't need to be renewed like for example Twitch um, yeah. it's, it, it's very unrepresentative and this and this is a thing um, by necessity I have to mention subscribers basically because the mainstream audience still recognizes that that's a metric that they understand <laughs> yeah but in there there is a chunk talking about actually we talk about subscribers but you have 16 year old kids who you know subscribed to Zoella when they were that age mm. you know 10 13 years later they're now parents with kids so they don't have time to watch yeah, her but videos. they're still showing up yeah. as part of the metric is there a historical precedent for the youtube industry so that's the question that i ask literally everybody that i interview and nobody gives me a good answer um I, I think probably there is in terms of the early days of Hollywood mm. in that you think about it and you know I, I used to love silent films and so you'd have like Charlie Chaplin and Fatty Arbuckle and people like that who would literally make you know these very small films on a shoestring budget running around doing everything themselves and then suddenly you had the consolidation you have things like United Artists coming around yeah. and everybody teams up as a production firm and so I think and they were contracted to a particular studio exactly. and it was basically integrated yeah exactly and so now everything is happening like that and and mm. so we had like the yeah again another theory that I haven't really fleshed out but is one that I think about a lot it keeps me awake at night because this is what I do with YouTube is um, we had that first wave of an attempt at business and I think of it a bit like a tide in terms of like the early MCNs mm. like it was people realized oh there's money in this space I'm gonna come in and ruin everything essentially and they did, <laughs> you know, they did, they did yeah. terribly and, and the model didn't work and you look at all the MCNs that have gone to the wall and the massive hundred million dollar plus purchases oh, and stuff yeah, yeah. And, and they failed and so they went away like the tide and we had a little bit more of sort of you know creator entrepreneurial led YouTube for a bit and then now we're seeing an awful lot of consolidation a lot of mergers and acquisitions on the business side and a lot of traditional media companies coming in and buying up the properties that those individual creator entrepreneurs have made so by comparison then to the old Hollywood system yeah. does that mean then that in the future do you think we'll see more legislation coming in to prevent monopolies either from YouTube itself or from governments <sighs> that's a good question I don't know I mean because that was what happened in the in the cinema yeah. industry, right? It yeah. was the, it was forty seven something, something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, it was breaking up the studios, preventing them from owning every part of distribution, production, marketing. I mean, I think that YouTube as a company is so hands off on that stuff that I can't imagine them doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's. But would it not? But would a, um, a, a monopoly on the website not diminish the uh, profit for YouTube? In that a competition on the website would improve viewership, it would improve the money that's going into the platform. I think it would, but I think that uh, the opportunity for expansion is still so great in that there are untapped viewers that they wouldn't get to the point where they're saturated. They have to, yeah, basically. I see. Okay, so, th so there's an, it's an imperfect analogy, but for the moment, yeah, early, early, early Hollywood does feel like it's quite appropriate. Yeah, in, in that you have people you know, setting up things and some of them fail, some of them really succeed and become you know, in that firmament of Hollywood celebrities and they become mainstream. And then you have people who are better than others who manage to sort of grab more of that stuff. Mm. And you have 
you know, businessmen and women coming in and saying, well, actually, we can help you expand in this way, but you have to maybe compromise your creative vision. And so that's why we get endless sequels. That's why we get all these stupid videos that are all the same, basically. And also, you do notice it that you have almost incubators now for channels. You get, I've noticed that some of the study tubers, for example, suddenly explode in viewership and in subscribers because they've been noticed by somebody at a company and they've had money invested in them. Yeah. It's a smart bet, isn't it? I mean, if you take the hypothesis, which I strongly suggest that you should, which is that this is a, a massive modern media monolith, that it is replacing TV and is probably going to replace film at some point. And you think, well, if I want to make money, then it makes sense for me to just continue to follow the money, basically. So you, just to bring you back on that point, yeah. you, you think that YouTube is eventually going to replace film? Yeah, so I, I took, well, I mean, yeah, why not? Right? Let's, <laughs> let's make bold predictions. No, I think it is becoming a respected medium. And I think that a lot of, when I talk to creators, a lot of them are getting bored of doing the same 10, 15 minute stuff. And they are trying to be a bit more uh, expansionist in terms of what they do. So, so go longer. Like Shane Dawson's documentary. Yeah, series. Shane Dawson, uh, you know, Logan Paul's terrible conspiracy theory thing. Um, there are creators that I've spoken to who have said that they are planning to do films, film length stuff on YouTube that in the next question, year or so. That was a format. Is that, because there's obviously going to be a continual groundswell of there's going to be new talent coming in that wants to do the stuff that they've grown up watching. Yeah. So would that mean that the older creators are going to stay on YouTube? Is it going to be migration to a new service? Because that's the other thing we should point out. As you mentioned in the book, there's a history of online video. Yeah. There are no competitors to YouTube, really. If, if Amazon actually decides to pay attention to Twitch, yeah. and if Twitch starts doing more IRL streams, then potentially that's something. Facebook Watch has just kind of died a slow death. Yeah. It, it didn't really work. Uh, you know, TikTok is building its own thing, but it's very different. Yeah. Um, Netflix, yeah, you can see even with Netflix, it has yeah. its own thing, but it is a very different Yeah, exactly. Set. And so, I mean, yeah, like it, it's, it's YouTube's game to lose, I think, and you know, some of the decisions that they make may <laughs> may make that more likely, but I mean, the, it's not going away, it's the thing. It's been here 14 years, it's... Mm. it's And with no competitors yeah. inside. I mean, do you, do you think that there will ever be... Is it is it even possible for a competitor to YouTube to appear? I don't see why you would. I mean, people... I get press releases about, um, you know, blockchain-based video platforms yeah. and things that will reward creators better um, all the time. And you look at Vimeo, which has kind of stuck around, but is very much in the... Indie sort of, filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 I think there's there's space to do something more culturally interesting, and you can carve out a niche in the online video space by being a platform that isn't so all-encompassing, that doesn't have people like you and people like Zoella and people like Logan Paul on the same platform. I think that you you know you can get subsections of that, but in terms of replacing the whole thing and becoming absolutely massive, no, I, I, it's because, difficult. Because the thing is that I've noticed on YouTube is that the channels that, the recent channels which are incredibly successful are the ones that are very specialized. Yeah. Um, you know, Tearzoo is an example I like to give from the edgy community. It's, it's just its thing, does it very well, but that's it, you know, and you know, and I, I should point out, I bloody love Tears. I'm not, I'm not putting that as a negative example, but um, you, the fact that yeah, as a platform, the breadth is enormous. So perhaps yeah, that there won't be a competitor because no platform will seek to be as broad because specialization is key. And you don't need to. I mean, there's, there's a quote in there. I can't remember. If it was from Hank or John Green, um, who said that he yeah, he goes to VidCon now, and he will walk past people who have like two million subscribers or you know, X million views every month. And he won't know who on earth they are because this, this platform is so big. It's like, is it, uh, I think at the end of 2018, there were, was it 4,000 channels with more than a million subscribers or more than 10 million subscribers? I can't remember which. And you, you look at that and you think, all these people are major celebrities yeah. and, and they could be doing anything from cooking to- To gaming. Yeah, to, to gaming to edgy tube. Do you think that YouTube is a net positive for the world? It depends on what day it is, to be honest. <laughs> um, look, it, it's it's given 
people the opportunity to enter the creative industry who would otherwise not have had the chance. It's been massively interesting and important in terms of democratization. Mm. Um, but along with that, there is a whole mess of societal stuff which we haven't got a handle on and which we don't yet know the answers to. There are people doing research right now um, at the University of Westminster about uh, burnout and the impact of that. Um, I'm really concerned about what happens when you are a kid who is four years old and instead of holding a hairbrush in front of a mirror and doing a song, you film it and then that's up there forevermore. Um, mm. I'm worried about what happens uh, when you become famous, the Charlie McDonald example is perfect, you become famous at 16 and it's kind of not necessarily the person that you actually truly are, but it's yeah, a little his, bit. His quote was the line that I think stuck with me the most, actually, from the whole book. That, that I made that mask when I was 14 and it doesn't fit me anymore. Yeah, and that's... that's I, I, I say this quite a lot to people because it's... I don't want to be like the old man shouts at the moon thing, but like <laughs> that is this year's burnout discussion, I think, is what happens when you grow out of being the person that you are and your audience is so committed and so great and the stakes are so high that you feel beholden almost to, to the be, digital version of yeah, yeah to be the person that you are and not and actually there was a really interesting question um because I, I put out a, a thing about this and then trenton lee who is doing some research uh, here in london about burnout um he's really interesting he uh, he asked whether or not that's actually just a thing that's related to YouTube or whether that's a wider societal thing where as you grow up as like a terrible teen years now whether or not we're also going to have to add in the fact that you have to reckon with the idea of reinventing and stepping away from your digital self now scary isn't it? it is <laughs> it, 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 it again brings home what, it's incredible to me that it's taken this long for a book like this to come out about it yeah. it's one of the, the major to me, obviously I'm biased because I am a YouTuber and I consume a lot of YouTube, but one of the kind of key digital pillars in the temple of the internet. Yeah. And, you know, so that so little is understood about it by the general public. Well, it's because, so I am 29 going on 30. And so I grew up um, and, you know, 2007, 2008, stuff like that. I was watching Bo Burnham and Wheezy Waiter and people like that and loving it. Mm -hmm. And I've grown up with this platform. Um, if you were even slightly older than me, if you were two, three, five years older than me, you didn't have that sort of digital native thing. YouTube yeah. wasn't necessarily a formative experience for you as it was for me. So all of the people who are covering this in the journalism world are sort of my age or younger. And, it's, and that's the, uh, the youngest you could possibly yeah. be. So that's kind of partly why it's not been a case, is that up until now, everybody who has professed to have an opinion about this has been an old person that didn't really use the platform, I think. <laughs> One that I actually really love is uh, Lofty Pursuits, uh, mm -hmm. which is a boiled sweet making channel the guy uh, is based in florida and he's he has this shop basically and he goes through how he makes these sweets using traditional uh, methods and things like that and it's kind of a little bit like asmr in a weird way because it's just relaxing yeah um and i interviewed him it didn't really make it into the book much of it but um it was interesting because he said that uh, his watch time is absolutely crazy because yeah. it starts late at night as people are going to sleep and they just fall asleep and they just auto play through the night. <laughs> so he's like, it's great. I mean, I'm making this money. Um, I'm getting subliminal advertising because they're asleep and they're probably hearing some of it. Yeah. But he was a bit like, should I be concerned that I am sending oh, people to sleep? You really mess with people with that. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Well, actually, that, that does uh, an equal sort of ASMR relation is, have you seen the IKEA ASMR advert? No. It's got, hang on, where's my phone? Now let's take a look at the desk. It's your standard issue dorm provided desk. This is the super flexible Johnzio LED work lamp. It's slim, lightweight, and easy to move around. 
Listen. You know, uh, oh, Dodie did an ASMR thing as well. Okay. Like, it, it's interesting that that's a subculture that people are kind of poaching. So I'd be interested to see if there are other subcultures and very because ASMR is pretty weird. Yeah. I admit. I mean, I love it, but it's it's weird. Yeah. Um, you know, if people could could find some undiscovered gem of YouTube, and be like, this is advertising gold. Well, I mean, you, you have you have ASMR at the minute, and then like a year or so before that, you had like mukbang and things like that. So I don't know. These these things tend to come from nowhere and. What's interesting is, and this kind of goes to the idea of the maturity, is that if someone finds a winning formula or a winning format, a video, everybody seems to do it now, which is kind yeah, of interesting. The life cycle seems to shrink over yeah. time. The, the, the before, trends would last for a really long time, and now it's over and done within a couple of days. It feels That's like. the tension span, isn't it? And it's also just the scale of it. If you have mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of creators putting out the same thing, Viewers get sick of it quicker, I think. Yeah, like, you know, compare, I don't even know, something like the Harlem Shake, for example. Yeah. It felt like it was over and done within a week. It was like a weird fever dream yeah. that the world had. <laughs> but, you know, and that really happened. It's, it's still on there, and, that, you know, presumably those videos, the, the, the view graphs must be fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, imagine what what happens if you're an alien that comes to this planet and just says what on earth is, is that about why like yeah why 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 are they dancing in their offices <laughs> and then yeah and you kind of think about that as a you know it's what only been like five years removed now from from that if that i don't even know when it happened I know. it's on the screen now yeah when it happened. there you go i make you do all that i think um and Looking back at it, you say it's like a fever dream. Like th these things just capture the zeitgeist and then disappear and burn out so fast. Now. Well, I would, I'd, I'd love it. And uh, someone in the comments, please tell me if this is actually already exists. I would love something like a visual representation of what is trending on YouTube at a time. So not the YouTube trending tab, as in a network of kind of tags that rise and fall, and you're going to have stuff like gaming that's always going to be there. Yeah. You know, every now and again you'll get something like ha hashtag Harlem Shake, which just erupts. And then you check it the next day and it's shrunk and it's shrunk and it's shrunk and it's shrunk. And a visual representation of, for an alien's benefit, to say, <laughs> what media are the humans consuming today? That would be the front page of what of human consciousness. That would also be great for me as a journalist, so find it, please. If, you, if it doesn't exist, somebody please code that. Yeah, please. Somebody who's better at coding than me. <laughs> Oh, don't even say you know about that, me. If you found this chat interesting, which I hope you did, um, this book is basically more of the same. Yeah. I think, really. Um, it is a very comprehensive, uh, as comprehensive as it is possible for one account to be, um, representation of what it is like to be on the inside of YouTube. Uh, and I, I just, I really hope it does well. I hope that this sparks people to understand us a lot better. You know, it's almost like an anthropological study. Yeah of vloggers, of, of YouTubers in general. So um, yeah, I, you know, if, check it out. There'll be a link down there in the description uh, if you do want to check it out. And uh, thank you so much for having a chat with me Thank today. you, it means a lot. Your socials will be down there as well. Bro, right. super. You know, you're on everything. Uh, yeah, you're apart from YouTube, weirdly. God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. How do you not have a YouTube channel? Because too much effort, my God, can you imagine? Oh, true, yeah, it is, it is a lot.